Well, good morning. I'm just going to uh, get this set up here. There we go. All right. I'd like to uh, begin by thanking Andy for those, uh, those hymns. I think several of them fit in with some of the things we're going to talk about this morning. Um, I've always been fascinated by angels, and I thought, well, let me find out a bit more about them. And so you're going to learn a little bit more about them today. Uh, perhaps you know a lot about angels. They're mentioned quite a bit throughout the scriptures. And um, so hopefully it'll be, be helpful and encouraging for you uh, today as we, as we look at them. I'm just going to just pray once more and then, and then we'll get started. Our Father, we just thank you again that we can be here today. We can hear from you, from your word. And we just pray that um, as we listen to what your word tells us about angels. We would be encouraged um, and, and better equipped, our Father. And we thank you for these mighty servants of yours. And we just pray your blessing now on our time. In Jesus' name, amen. There's one, one name of God that's directly linked to um, his angels, and it's the Lord of hosts. Um, and it directly links him with these mighty um, angel armies uh, that are his and at his disposal. You may remember the story of um, David uh, and Goliath, and the, the armies of the Philistines were fighting against the armies of Israel, and there was kind of an impasse, and Goliath would come up every day and, and taunt the, the armies of Israel and, and, and say, you know, give me someone that I can fight against. And day after day this happened. And finally, David said to Saul, I'm going to go and I'm going to fight him. And this is what David says to the Philistine. Um, he says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And David realized that their victory on the battlefield wasn't going to be over which army was stronger but he knew that it was the Lord that was going to give them the victory, and he had already indicated that to, to David. And in the same way, um, in an even greater sense, God's invisible army um, is the one that he will use to, to bring about many things um, in this world and uh, to fulfill his purposes. Um, another passage of scripture well known and loved to many is Psalm 46 and it begins by saying God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore we will not fear and why the Lord of hosts is with us the God of angel armies the God of Jacob is our stronghold um, some of you may know the uh, uh, the psalm by Chris Tomlin uh, entitled uh, whom shall I fear uh, the God of angel armies. And I'd just like to read the first verse and chorus because I think it just really emphasizes these, these truths here. It goes like this. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? And he's speaking of God. You crush the enemy under my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And so the, the God of angel armies, uh, the Lord of hosts, is the, the God that we know and, and love today. 
Throughout the, the Old Testament, especially the prophets, over and over again, this name, the Lord of hosts, comes up. And Amos here uses it in, in this verse here, and I'll just read it to you. He says, For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. And Amos is saying, you know, he's, he's the creator. He's the one who reveals things to us. He is everywhere. And he is the Lord God of hosts, the one whose, whose armies um, aid him at all times. There are a number of names used of angels in scripture. I've got some of them up there. I won't read each of them to you. Um, but many different ways they're, they're described, and we'll look at some of that uh, in more detail. Uh, we're not going to look at uh, Satan and his fallen angels today. There's just not enough time, but perhaps uh, for another time. There seem to be two general categories of angels, um, just as there are two kingdoms in Scripture, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And Paul says in Colossians 1, he says, uh, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so we have the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of light, of course, is, is God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, the one that we are brought into when we believe in the Lord Jesus. And God dwells in the light and we are told to walk in his light, in his presence, in his purity and holiness. But then there's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, um, the one who has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe, and the one who's enslaved people who don't believe in him. And we've been brought out of that kingdom into the kingdom of light. And just as there are two kingdoms, there are two kinds of angels, God's angels in the kingdom of light, and Satan and his angels in the kingdom of darkness. And it says that Satan sometimes even disguises himself as an angel of light, even though he is no longer one of those. Um, angels are created beings, so God created them. Uh, he created us as well. He created us differently, and we reproduce after our kind, but angels don't seem to do that. It's, it, it would seem that he created all of them at once, and there's a fixed number of them. Um, some good, some, some bad. Um, it would appear that they were all good at one point, and yet um, Satan and those that followed him rebelled against God, possibly a third of the angels siding with him. One thing to remember, though, um, is that God is infinitely more powerful than any angel. They're, they're his created beings. He made them. And he allows them to, to, to only have so much. Um, so they're, they're still under his control. Um, we don't know how many angels there are, but we just know that there are a lot of them. Um, in, in Hebrews 12, it says that there are myriads of angels. And I had to look that up. A myriad just means so many that you can't count. Um, so there are, there are a lot of angels. In fact, in Revelation 5, it says there are myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. I think John was trying to describe what he couldn't describe, the fact that there are many, many angels um, at God's command. Um, what are they like? What do they look like? Well, they are, Hebrews 1 tells us that they are spirit beings, so like God is a spirit without a physical body. Um, although they can sometimes appear as human beings. In Genesis uh, 18 and 19, uh, the Lord and two of his angels appeared to Abraham um, as, as humans. And in he Hebrews 13, it says that we may entertain angels without even realizing it. So they, they look like, they can look like people as well. At other times, they're so dazzling in their brilliance, they're the light of God radiating from them, um, that uh, humans are, are, are afraid. And in fact, almost every time that angels appear in the scripture to people, uh, the response is fear uh, on the part of the people that, 
that, uh, that see them because of their, their dazzling appearance. Um, a couple different kinds of angels, we'll get into this more later, but the, the ones called seraphim, um, only found in Isaiah chapter six, have six wings. Um, and the, another group of angels called cherubim, or they're also called the four living beings in Ezekiel, um, are described in, in different ways. So they have a human form, they have four faces, four wings. Each of their faces represents a different aspect of the Lord Jesus. Um, and those are, those are the f four aspects of the Lord Jesus found in the four gospels. So the, the face of the man um, is a picture of Christ in the gospel of Luke, where he's the perfect man living in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Um, the lion is a picture of the Lord Jesus as the king. And in Matthew's uh, gospel, he is, he is presented as the, as the king. And then the bull, the picture of the Lord Jesus as the servant in, in the gospel of Mark. And then the eagle, uh, the son of God. The eagle's in the heavens and, and the son of God comes from heaven. So even in their appearance, they tell us something about what God is like. Each had a wheel within a wheel. I'm not sure exactly how that looks, but it seemed like they could go in any of four directions. Um, and their whole bodies, their wings, and their wheels were covered, were full of eyes, suggesting that God sees everything. And, and they're, they're associated with the presence of God. And above them was the sea of glass and then the throne of God. And we see a similar picture in the book of Revelation. Um, and in fact, the uh, images uh, of these, like these gold, gold versions of the, these cherubs uh, were part of the mercy seat uh, in the tabernacle and in the temple, in the most holy place where God, it said, dwelt uh, above the, the cherubim. So God's presence was there. So they're very much associated with God's presence. Talk a little bit more about them later. Um, what are angels like? We've talked about what they look like, uh, the fact that they're created beings. There's a few things that describe their characteristics. First of all, they're under the authority of the risen and ascended Christ. Um, they are God's angels, and they're under His direct authority. And uh, in First Peter, it says, "Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ." who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. So they are under his direct control and command. And they are also obedient to him, uh, and they fear him. Uh, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. I think... I could learn a lot from, from the obedience of angels. They're different from us in the sense that they're not, um, they didn't need to be redeemed. They, they don't fall into temptation like we do from what we understand. And yet they perfectly obey uh, the Father. They also greatly fear or respect God. They stand in awe of him uh, as we see in, in Psalm 89. It says, a God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. Uh, and those two things, obedience and, and, and reverence for God, should characterize us as, as his people uh, as well. They're very discerning and, and wise. Uh, you may remember the story of uh, Absalom and how he... Um, he did a lot of things that he shouldn't have done and, and his father didn't want anything to do with him. And Absalom was trying to, to get to see his father again. And so he sent this wise woman to King David with a story. Um, and in the middle of the story, the wise woman says this. She says, please let the word of my Lord the King be comforting for as an angel of God, so was my Lord the King to discern good and evil and may the Lord your God be with you. And so she understood, and it was understood that angels were, 
were wise and discerning. And she compared David to an angel in that sense. Um, and so angels seem to have, have some of the characteristics of the God that they serve and, and worship. They're also mighty in strength. And I think this might be part of the reason why they're so feared when, when seen by humans. Uh, we read part of this verse earlier, and it says that they are mighty in strength who perform his word. Much stronger than humans, um, as we'll see in a minute. They're also not omniscient. They don't know everything, but they are knowledgeable. Um, the Lord Jesus said that not even the angels of heaven know when he is going to be returned um, to set up his kingdom. But they do know many things. Uh, in Luke 15, it says, In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When someone turns to the Lord Jesus for salvation, there is joy in heaven. That, might, that means they know about all the people that are getting saved all over the world every day. So there's a, they know a lot, um, it would seem, but they don't know as much as God does. Uh, they're immortal beings, they cannot die. Um, in Luke 20, um, it says, for they, the, the resurrected believers, cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So angels uh, do not die. Um, in fact, we know in the, in the future that Satan and his angels uh, will suffer um, eternally in, in the lake of fire. Um, so they don't, they don't die, they, they live forever. Uh, the good angels with God and, and those who disobeyed him, um, not, not in God's presence. And so in that sense, we are, we are like angels, in fact, in that sense that we will, we will live forever. Even though we die physically, um, we will live forever in either one of two places. Um, as a believer, I'm going to be with the Lord forever. Uh, if I don't believe in the Lord, I'm going to be separated from him forever. Um, angels also have greater honor uh, than, than people and greater strength, as, as we said earlier. In fact, so much so that some people mistakenly worship angels in the Bible. In fact, uh, we shouldn't be too hard on, on other believers. Even the Apostle John, at the end of the, the book of Revelation, fell down and, and worshipped at the foot of this angel that was revealing these truths to him. Um, but he says... John writes, he says, when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he, that's the angel, said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. And it reminded me that obviously we shouldn't worship angels, um, but we sure shouldn't worship anyone or anything other than God um, as believers. God is, is the one whom we ascribe worth to, but, but no other person and no other thing should have um, that place in my life. And finally, um, angels do not marry, um, so they don't have, have children either. All right, types of angels. You may have read through the scriptures and, and noticed different types of angels. I just want to refer to a few different ones. I've found only three that have names in scripture. So one is, is Satan, and he has several names and titles, which we're not going to cover uh, this morning. And then there are two other angels that are named, Gabriel and Michael. And Gabriel seems to have uh, special importance. He's not called an archangel. But it's, he, he tells, um, in, in Luke 1, he says, I stand in the presence of God. Um, and so he, he had a, an important position. Other than that, we don't know. We know he was, um, he was uh, responsible for, for um, announcing the Lord's birth. Um, Michael as well... Um, 
seems to be of, of special importance. He's called one of the chief princes in Daniel, or he's called an archangel in the New Testament. And it says that he guards, stands guard over Israel. So it's like he's protecting uh, that nation of people. And so perhaps there are other angels that might protect other nations uh, of the earth. Uh, there is a suggestion uh, to that effect in, in Daniel where um, Michael comments about um, and, and I think a fallen angel um, as being over the, the, uh, the country of Persia. So there may be something to that effect that, that angels are responsible for overseeing uh, certain countries, either for good or for evil. Um, Michael also has a group of angels that, that serve with him. Uh, we see this in Revelation 12. And we see there that he can defeat, he can defeat Satan. Um, in my mind, uh, in, in the past, I used to think of God and Satan as, as counterparts. But that's not accurate. Satan is a created being. And it's probably more accurate to think of Michael and Satan as counterparts. And then God way up there somewhere. Um, uh, we referred to cherubim and seraphim earlier. Um, cherubim seem to be connected with the presence of God. They're always very near where God is, near his throne, reflecting his character, even in their faces. Um, Seraphim, only mentioned in Isaiah 6, seem to be connected with the holiness of God. They cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And one of them touches Isaiah's lips to cleanse him from sin before he, he goes to serve. The, uh, the living creatures in, in Revelation 5... May, they kind of have characteristics of both cherubim and seraphim, so I'm not sure where to put them in. Um, there seem to be different ranks of angels. It's not totally clear, but there are some suggestions. That, um, as we mentioned earlier, Michael seems to be one of the most prominent. He's called one of the chief princes in Daniel 10. Um, so obviously there were other princes of similar importance and responsibility to him. There's a reference in Joshua 5 to the captain of the host of the Lord, um, which suggests the, the, the leader of the Lord's armies. Um, but I'm not sure if it's an actual angel or if it's the Lord Jesus uh, uh, in his pre-incarnate state before he became, took on a human body. In the New Testament, there are a number of different Words suggesting different ranks of angels, words like thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, powers. They're mentioned three or four times. And in Psalm 89, it, there's even a reference to God's counsel, suggesting um, that there are some angels that are part of God's uh, inner circle, um, perhaps. Beyond that, uh, I'm not sure. Um, you kind of just get glimpses here and there. Well, what do angels do? We've talked about what they're, what they're like, uh, what some of the characteristics of them are. Generally speaking, um, angels are there to, to worship and to serve God. And uh, I've, I've highlighted um, a section from Psalm 103 again. And the, uh, the purple sections are, are the... The, the parts of the verse that talk about the worship and the blue sections about those section, uh, those aspects of their service for God. And uh, if, you're, if you're able to read it there with me, why don't we read um, those two verses together, starting with bless the Lord. So bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of the word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Commenting on, on Hebrews 1.7, William MacDonald has described angels in this way. He says, they obey with the speed of wind 
and the fervency of fire. And that would be my prayer for myself and for us, that we would obey God in that same way with the speed of wind, quickly, and with the fervency with the, of fire, uh, with, with zeal um, for God. Angels also seem to report for duty. Um, we see this in Job chapters 1 and 2, when Satan, along with other angels, came and, and presented themselves before the Lord, perhaps for their next assignment. If we look a little more in, in detail um, at the, the concept of angels worshiping the Lord, we come to a, one of my favorite passages, and I'm sure one that's very familiar to, to many of us, but the worship of God around the throne in heaven. And I'll just read these verses again from Revelation 5. John says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I can't use enough words to describe the, the worth of the Lamb and of the God that they served so willingly. And just as angels worship, um, we as his redeemed creatures um, should worship and ascribe the worth to our Savior and Redeemer. We'll have a chance to do that uh, together uh, in the next service, but it's something we can do every day uh, wherever we are, um, at home and throughout our day. Angels also rejoice. Uh, they sang for joy uh, in, in creation when God created the earth. They announced with great joy the coming of the Savior when those angels showed up uh, above the shepherds that one night and announced the birth of the Savior. And they rejoice every time a sinner repents. So there's much joy in heaven and uh, we should be filled with joy as we're seeing what God is doing, what he's done in our life and what he is doing in other lives as well. Um, angels also serve Jesus Christ when he's on earth. And you may have noticed as you read through the, the Gospels and, and beyond um, that angels are involved with, with many aspects of his life on earth. They announced his birth. They instructed Joseph to protect Jesus and his mother um, in Egypt and then bring them back. Um, angels cared for him following his temptation in the wilderness. Uh, an angel strengthened him at Gethsemane as he was anticipating going to the cross. Even after his resurrection, the, the angels rolled the stone away. And in the future, he will send his angels um, to, to gather together his elect. So uh, before he returns, to earth at the end of the tribulation, the angels will gather those who believe in him um, together. And then it says he will return to set up his kingdom, accompanied by his angels, and will repay every man according to his deeds. So they seem to be involved with every aspect of his life on earth, both in the past and, and yet to come. How do they relate to you and I, to those who believe in the Lord Jesus. Well, there are several ways that angels work to specifically minister to believers. And I found this verse really helpful in Hebrews 1.14. I'll just read it to you. Talking about angels, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? And so they're, they're ministering spirits. They're God's servants, but they're specifically sent out to serve those who are believers. And there are several ways that they do that. Um, you may recall um, in Acts chapter 8, Philip was guided by an angel and directed to uh, an Ethiopian eunuch who was coming back from Jerusalem who specifically wanted to know what this passage in Isaiah was talking about in the scriptures. And it says, The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
and he guided him to that specific individual at that right time in order for him to present the gospel to him. And um, God does that uh, with us today. I, I won't forsake of time. It's a little longer story. Um, I, I won't read it to you, but maybe I'll, I'll just summarize it. But in, um, in, in, in China, in, uh, recounted in, in William MacDonald's book, Our God is Wonderful, uh, of, of Bible smugglers who were trying to get into, uh, well, they came into China and they were going to, to take a domestic flight uh, but as it turns out, they had like three minutes to get from one terminal to the next. It was dark, it was starting to rain, and they knew they weren't going to make it. And all of a sudden, these, uh, uh, this one official came on a bicycle, and, and he said, get on, get onto my bike. And he wheeled him across with his suitcase over to the other terminal. And, and another one came and picked up his, his co-worker, and they got there just in time. And they went around to, to turn back to thank the, the men for taking them there. And they realized that they had disappeared. And so they wondered, were these two of God's angels sent at just this time to guide us, to get us quickly over to that, uh, to that next terminal and to their flight? Um, how else do they serve believers? They provide protection and deliverance. Um, this is going back to the, uh, the Exodus when the Israelites left Egypt and were headed to the Promised Land. And the Lord said, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. And God's angel went with them. It was a lot longer journey than it needed to be, but he went ahead of them and, and protected them through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. Psalm 91 also talks um, about God's angels, perhaps for, for individuals. For he will guard, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Um, Hank uh, lent me a, uh, a really encouraging book by uh, Marie Monson, a uh, missionary in Nor in, from Norway to China, and she recounts, it's not using this verse, it's another verse that she claimed as a promise, but she would claim God's promises and act in faith, and she was involved in, um, in preaching the gospel at a time where it was very difficult prior to the communist invasion, but the, the, the country was overrun with, uh, as she calls them, bandits. So individuals and, and groups of individuals looting and pillaging and she was in this one city, and um, an army, they had heard that an army of, of these bandits was coming through to pillage. And uh, they prayed and, and trusted the Lord to protect them. They found, well, the, the, um, uh, the bandits pillaged the, the whole city except for their mission compound. And uh, later, one of the, the soldiers from that army that had, had gone through said, she said, you know, why didn't you come and, and come into our compound? Well, he said, you had all these soldiers surrounding it. So she, can, she concluded that it, they were, sol they were uh, God's, God's soldiers, God's angels that had protected it and didn't allow the... Uh, the um, the looters to come in and, and pillage them. Um, we don't know how many times God's, God's angels have, have protected us. Um, in fact, the Bible suggests that there are guardian angels, perhaps, well, definitely for children, uh, and perhaps also for adults as well. Uh, in Matthew 18, it says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that the angels in heaven continually their angels in heaven, continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And it would appear that every child has an angel responsible for him or her, looking out for them, um, caring for them, and, in, and <laughs> intervening when necessary. Um, perhaps also for, for um, adults as well. 
certainly in Acts chapter 12, an angel had, had released Paul, uh, Peter rather, from prison. And um, he came to the house where they'd been praying for his release. The servant girl opened the door and didn't believe it was him. So she shut the door in his face and said, Peter's here. Of course, she left him standing out there and they said, oh, it can't be true. It must be his angel. So there was obviously some sort of belief that um, at least certain believers had angels and that maybe even looked like them. Uh, it's hard to say exactly. Um, but definitely the, there would appear to be guardian angels uh, that God uses to, to protect his people at certain times. Um, I remember not this recent time, it was a number of years ago, I was in Ottawa and driving through a construction area and it wasn't familiar to me and I wasn't paying as much attention as I should have. Just plug your ears, Joanne. <laughs> um, and so I was driving through this construction zone and, and all of a sudden there were these cars coming across in my path and I don't know how I got through, but I got through without any scratch on, on the car and myself intact. Um, and it had to be angelic intervention because I was convinced I was going to collide um, uh, with these other cars coming in the opposite direction. I'm sure you've, you've probably thought, you know, maybe that was an angel that, that, that helped me in this particular situation. Maybe you can think back to times um, where that was true in, in your own life as well. Um, angels are also involved in, in revealing the truth of God. Um, both the, the Old Testament law, um, Stephen says that it was ordained or given by angels. It was given by God, but he obviously used angels to give Moses those Ten Commandments. And in the same way, uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, it begins by saying that God is giving this and he's communicating it by an angel an angel to John who later, later wrote it down. So God uses his angels, he used them to give us the, the scriptures that we have today. Um, the, the very word of God given to us by God with the help of, of his angels. Um, angels are also involved in not only announcing coming judgment but also in carrying it out. And we see this, if you read through the book of Revelation, angels are constantly mentioned, uh, not only in revealing future judgment, but also in, in, in acting it uh, on those who, will, who, who refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus um, in the future. Um, they take us to heaven. I hadn't thought of this before, um, but the, the story of rich, Lazarus and the rich man um, it says, and the poor man died, that's Lazarus, and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, to, to heaven, um, to the place of blessing. And so it would seem, at least in this case, that when a, a believer dies, the, the angels take his or her spirit and soul to heaven. And not only that, but if the, the Lord comes before that, uh, at the rapture, um, the archangel is involved in that too. It says with the, the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. So in either case, whether I die or whether the Lord comes to take me, angels are involved in taking me from here uh, to heaven. Um, and finally, angels observe us. They, they watch and see what, what's going on. They observe our, our Christian lives, our, our church meetings. Um, they even are curious uh, about how it is that we have believed in the Lord Jesus and, and are desiring to live for him. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, um, the, the passage on, on headship and, and head covering, the, one of the reasons for the the uncovered men's heads and the covered women's heads, it says, is because of the angels. Um, so they, they want to understand how we submit to the authority of, of God. 
And in the first Peter one passage, uh, they long to look in to the things that the prophets predicted ahead of time, the sufferings of Christ and, and his glories to come. And there are Bible students. And so if they can be Bible students, then, then um, I should be too. Finally, just to, to wrap up here, um, how does this apply to us? We've touched on a few things. I'll just summarize them for you. Um, only God is worthy of our worship. No other person, no other thing. We too can live in the nearness to God, just as the cherubim did. Uh, we should be quick and eager to obey God. Like angels, we should rejoice that God is saving people each day and, and is at work in our world. Uh, we can trust Sorry, we can daily seek God's guidance um, that he gives us uh, in different ways and perhaps with the intervention of angels as well. We can trust the Lord to protect and to deliver us. Uh, we can also rejoice that God has used angels and prophets to give us the Holy Scriptures. Um, it says that they're everything that we need for life and godliness is contained in, in the words of this book. Uh, we can be confident that God will use angels to execute perfect judgment on the wicked in the future. We can be confident that God will get us to heaven uh, because he has said so and he will use even his angels to, to bring us there. And finally, the scriptures are worth seriously studying and obeying uh, just as the angels desire to look into these things. Well, we started with the Lord of hosts and I'd just like to end there by reading again these verses from Psalm 46. Um, because it's, it's his angel. It's not just angels we're looking at, but they are God's angels, God's messengers. And, and God is the one who has sent them um, to help us. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Let's just close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you are the Lord God of hosts, the God of angel armies, the God of infinite power and wealth and wisdom, and the God whose, whose servants uh, even serve us who have believed in him. Our Father, we thank you or all the ways that you minister to us. We may be more conscious of, um, of the way you are working and delight to see um, your deliverance and your guidance uh, as, we, as we go through our day and this week. And we thank you that um, if God is for us, who can be against us? And we just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.